listening to another episode of the Business Talks podcast. Uh, today, my guest is Charles Antis. He's the founder and CEO of Antis Roofing uh, with over 30, 30 years in the industry experience. Uh, so, Charles, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, pleasure to be here, Matt. Thanks for asking me on. Yeah, of course. Um, so why don't you tell, you know, start out by telling a little bit of a story for those that may not actually know uh, what Antis Roofing is and, and what you guys do. Um, would you mind kind of telling a little story of how you founded Antis Roofing and then also, you know, maybe some of the things that you've done uh, since then? It's been over 30 years now. Sure. Yeah, I, I love talking about Antis Roofing. Um, you know, Antis Roofing, I, me being in the roofing business, it wasn't something I did as a child. I grew up in the state of Oregon in a logging town, Myrtle Creek, Oregon, population 3,000. And Every man I knew did labor. Every yeah. man I knew was a laborer in the forest or in the mills. My dad was a foreman and safety director at Roseburg Lumber Products. So that's, that's where I grew up. You know, I, I did blue collar work, but I ended up in, in Southern California when I was 21. And I had come down, I was recruited for a sales position. And I was selling, knocking on doors, selling insulation uh, with some kind of rebate that California was doing. And I was promising mm -hmm. them savings. And here I am 21 years old, uh, finished my second year of college. I think I actually dropped out of those classes. I wasn't the most mature, <laughs> but I, I think I got zero credits that semester, but I was knocking on doors, selling insulation. I, I knocked on this family store and, and it was a deaf family, deaf, they couldn't hear. And uh, so I was able to communicate with them, right? And I had this sale that made me feel so good. And they were so happy. I, they were going to have the savings on their home. And the next day, I drove back to this house, to this deaf family's house to pick up the check. And when I knocked on the door, I saw them in there, but they didn't answer. And I'm a, you know, I, I'm a people pleaser. It's just like, oh. And then the neighbor walked over to me and she says, get out of here. I said, why? And she says, because you, you lied to this family. You told them that they were going to have this energy savings. And look at that. There's no way they're going to have that. And I looked at what she said. And I said you know, I, I just walked away. I can't believe I'm, I'm getting emotional already. I didn't think that would happen right now. But, but it hurt me because um, I felt connected to this family. And that means something to me if I sell something that there's value there. And so uh, looking back, um, I quit that night. I quit. Here I was in Southern California. They owed me money, but not that much because I didn't do that much selling. I was playing mm -hmm. a little too much. And, but I, I looked for a job and, and, I, and I, I didn't see myself doing anything but labor. I, you know, I just, so I looked for a job and a job to me was labor. And I, I met this roofer and he said, I don't have any work, but I think this guy does. And I, I met this roofer named Tim Curtis and he was a, I, I just learned the business from him. I learned how to solve leaks from him. And that was a fascinating experience. I, I was telling the story yesterday. Um, what I loved about roofing, because I didn't love the hard work. I just knew I could do it. Work to me and the way I was raised was the toil and labor of men. And you get slivers and you could get injured. In fact, you could die, but you go to work every day. And it happened all around me that men died and men were injured. So this going to work in the roofing business, I didn't do it for pleasure. It was a job. And I found that there was one thing that fulfilled me um, and, it, and it started with kind of a train wreck because I was told by my boss to go out and do this leak repair and I'd seen him do leak repairs before and I went out and I looked above this leak and sure enough I found it and if you're in the roofing business there, every roofer thinks he's the best at roof repair we just do it's an ego thing and I have to be careful <laughs> even though I even though I truly am the best I have to act like oh, so everyone thinks so I go out on this job and there's coping metal and coping metal is just cat metal that covers like a little wall. And I realized it was going through this nail hole at this joint in the coping metal. I took it apart, sealed it, put it back together. And then my boss came out of the job and I said, Hey, I found that leak. And I walked over there like a big man. And I said, there it is. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's the leak. All right. But he did, he didn't repair it. Right. And he, <laughs> he pointed out that I had had backlap the coping metal. So, um, so the water going down would be forced under that and it would leak again eventually. And he says, this is the easiest thing in the world. He goes, every component on a duck's back is like a, like, a, like a feather on a duck's back. Every component overlaps what's below. And that failure on that first leak um, was, <laughs> one of, I love failing. Failing is how I learn everything. I don't win anything by winning. I think I know why I won. But when I do something wrong, it's a lesson. It just doesn't emotionally spike me anymore like it did then. But I said, by God, I'll never miss a leak again. And I, I became the best at doing leaks. And that was the thing that when Tim's work slowed down and I kind of had that moment where I had a couple side jobs, 
that was the thing that I could do. I could sell that service of fixing anything that leaked from rain. And that's who I became, you know, that, that guy that would snoop and cause that's the only calls I'd get. And I truly, if you called me to do when I started my company, then that's when I started it. If you would have called me and give me more, uh, given me the opportunity to do a re-roof, a lot of them, I just couldn't have done. I didn't have the crew. I didn't have the kettle. I didn't have the experience, but give me that thing that nobody else could solve. Give mm-hmm. me that week. Let me come out and let me play because, you know, I got nothing else to do. And I would take things apart and I would put it back together. And I just became this, this Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg? No, no, I wasn't Snoop Dogg. <laughs> um, I became this <laughs> hound dog. Hound dog, where I would find that leak and I would, you know, literally imagine myself as a bead of water and how gravity and capillary action would pull me down that wall. And I became the very best at solving leaks. And that's how our company got going. We did a lot of leak repairs eventually. And eventually we were able to do these um, maintenances because I couldn't compete with the big roofs. They're going to spend a million dollars. They're going to spend a million dollars to get an average, they're getting about 24 years on this roof. But I can get them 10 more years for $100,000. And in fact, I'll guarantee it. And that's what we started doing. We started doing these things called special ops. And special ops is we go, yeah, they're selling you that because that's the way the industry is. But do you realize that 20% of our landfills are filled with roofing material? Let's get you this roof um, to last 10 more years. And, mm-hmm. and let's, let's spend 40% of the money per year that you were going to spend. And that's what we did. And we still do that, even though we do a lot of re-roofing now. Um, Obviously, we've grown into that. But that's kind of how – that's I skipped over all the good stuff. That's just (laughs) the leak leak, uh, path, the journey curve of the leak repair and how it turned into who we are today, problem Uh solvers that go in and engineer roofs that last 30 years. And we have a saying that every nail matters – because it does. Whether we're talking about the people that we invest in or we're talking about every 200,000 nail part in that roof, every nail matters. And in, in, in an Antis, we invest in our people, and that's why we have the best product. But it didn't start that way. It started a long time ago, and I, I don't know where you want me to go, but I, I usually tell this origin story, I call it, because it's when purpose hit, and that's when, mm-hmm. um, when I, I fell upon a family that had mold in their room, and I didn't know what to do. And I, I mm-hmm. could go down that path, but I don't want to steer you away from your podcast. No, let, let's do that, and then we'll get right into you know, how to lead through COVID-19. <laughs> but I like that story. I've heard you say it before, so feel free. Okay. So, so it's like um, yeah, I'm in that beginning stage. Um, I, I'm needing work. Um, and, and, and I no longer work for this guy. And so it's like, Oh my God, I have a mortgage payment to make. I have a girl, a little girl. And, and so my work one week, cause I only got about three calls a week was putting weather stripping around the bedroom that had converted to be a home office. And I got that so they wouldn't hear my daughter crying. And so I, you know, I'm kind of selling in a business to business model. The work that I got was at HOAs. That's all I got a couple repairs here. And so I get a call one day from a woman and she's got leaks in her home. It leaks in every room. And that sounds very appealing to me because I make a few hundred dollars per leak and I have a mortgage payment to make in two weeks. And so the next day I'm driving to her house and, and I remember I'm driving as I'm driving to her home in LA, the homes are getting smaller, more disheveled until finally I turn on the street where the home would be. And I just, oh, I just see this like dead grass house set back. I'm thinking maybe that's not the house because it's got one of those 140 and a half or something. And I, and I go up on it and I knock on the door and then three things happen really fast that just all the impression never leaves me. This woman answers the door and she's got this tired look like, and before I can say hello, I'm hit with this smell of mildew. Uh That just almost knocks me down. I want to recoil uh, and, you know, I'm a, I'm, mildew bothers me more than some people. I'm really recoiling. But as I start to recoil and wondering what I'm going to say to leave the home, I, I feel a tug at my finger. And I look down, and there's just like this beautiful little blonde girl. Like, I mean, her, in contrast to her mom and me and our expressions, how they mine was, must have been. I mean, she was just like, oh, my God, I have a visitor in my home. And she grabs me, and she pulls me in that living room. Of course I go and into this undersized hallway and then she goes into her room and I know it's her room because she looks up immediately and looks at me and 
pointing to a My Little Pony poster on the wall. But mm-hmm. as she did that, I just like, you know, I, I don't know, I just looked down and there was four mattresses. And, you know, I'm hitting, oh, this is where our siblings sleep. And then I like, oh, my God, there's mold on the mattresses. And mm-hmm. I just, I just kind of sat there in this, in this um, awful state because I, I was aware that, oh, crap, they, need, they have no money. Oh, mm-hmm. they have, they, their roof is probably shot. I got to get out of here. And, I mean, I remember there, it felt like 30 seconds. Maybe it was only 10 or 15. But then the mom walked back in. And I don't you know, you know, the little girl's face as cute as she was and I wanted to help. But, you know, when the mom came in and I saw that face again, I just, something came out of me. I just said, I'm going to take care of your roof. You know, and I was like, what did I just say? And, and, <laughs> but I, but I, um, I, cause I didn't know, will I be able, can I? And, and so I, I, I just, you know, that was a profound moment that I, I wanted mm-hmm. to tell you because that has happened to me so many times since. And I think the reason that we're successful at Antis is because we can't let anybody have a leaky roof just because they don't have the money to pay. And it started right there. That was our doctor on an airplane moment where, you know, you know, if a doctor's on an airplane, I think we all believe that he or she, if they hear that call, they're going to raise their hand and go, yes, I'm a doctor. And they're going to yeah. help out. And I also believe that we believe that that doctor, he or she will not send a bill for that. I just, just it wouldn't happen. And that yeah. looking back was my doctor and airplane one. Cause we gave that family, I went up on the roof and they needed a whole new roof. And so I went and got on the phone and I got six volunteers and seven of us that weekend gave that family. I think there was like six or seven kids. We gave them this drippy goopy, not my best roof, but it was dry and they stayed in their home. And that was a powerful moment because it mm-hmm. became, it, I didn't start telling that story till 10 years ago. But that story repeated itself often quietly. Sometimes um, the, the people knew. I didn't always tell my employees because they didn't always agree with it. They didn't want to go out of business. And how can I afford to donate something? But that eventually turned into a philosophy here at Antis that we believe. In fact, I think it's on the wall behind me. Um, yep. he, you know, we, we exist to keep families safe and dry. I I couldn't remember what the slogan was. It didn't come off my tongue. But we know why we exist. I mean, It's the beautiful thing when you know why you exist. And that's so easy. Like, of course, we're a roofer. We keep people safe and dry. But it took us 30 years almost to come up with that slogan. And -hmm. it's so pure. And it answers questions that don't need to be asked. Because when somebody in customer service gets a call and they know why we exist, it's to keep families safe and dry. They get that family safe and dry. Mm -hmm. They're not contingent. They know that we, why we exist. And that's a powerful thing. So we try to create purpose today that kind of started from some of those stories of all those years of, you know, yes, it didn't ever get formalized until we ran into Habitat for Humanity. And you would ask me about that earlier. Um, Did you want me? Yeah, absolutely. No, keep going. So, so it was really awkward in the beginning when I'm, you know, I can't say no to somebody like this. And then, and then my team didn't always take it well. And then Sharon Ellis, the CEO here in Orange County of Habitat for Humanity, a friend of mine, a friend of mine um, wanted me to call her, and I'm uh, Greg. Um, I can't, his last name's not coming, but Greg wanted me to call her, and I, I, I said, "Why? Well, yeah, I'll donate a roof." And but yeah, sure. He's trying to tell me I should do that, and I didn't understand why he was saying that. I think he had a better marketing brain than me, and he said you should call her. And he, he said you should. I didn't understand it. So finally, Sharon Ellis calls me, the CEO of Orange County Habitat for Humanity, and she asked me herself, "Will you donate a roof?" And it was just so pure. I said, "Yes." It was an easy answer. And then we, we donated that roof, and then she came back and said, hey, there's, there's a military, neighborhood of military families. Will you donate another roof? There's sure. And then, will you donate these eight roofs? And that was a tough pill for my team to swallow because it meant more weekends for marketing. It meant, more, um, it meant uh, more work for production, but with no money coming behind it. And, mm-hmm. and that's where it, it, my, my, my enthusiasm was separate from my team. And, and you know, a CEO needs to be – it needs to be the, a combined story, not just your story. I, I tell my stories, but I, I can't keep them under a bushel and I need to share with them. And so in the beginning, it was kind of like, I like to say it was, I was like Will Ferrell in an old school when he's streaking down the road by himself, but he thinks there's a crowd and his wife comes and says, get in the car. And he's like, come on, honey, everybody's doing it. That's <laughs> how I feel when I get too much out in front. And so I think the balance is, 
is really critical. Your HR yeah. team needs to be aligned. So the way we eventually built that is um, we we started doing builds and we started inviting our people, our employees, our other stakeholders. Everybody started coming out. And when everybody started coming out, we started to feel, we started doing meals of love together at Ronald McDonald House. We started doing, um, installing fire alarms for, um, um, for you know, we started doing American Red Cross. We're actually doing a blood drive and we're donating 6,000 feet on Monday. We're collecting blood with American Red Cross on Monday here. We really believe in that today. But back then, it was just all this learning it. And what, what happened was eventually it became a thing. It became something we talked about. It became part of our stories. We all have Habitat stories. And now when I talk about it, there, there's other stories that mesh. There's contextual understanding, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of like overlapping and aligning our values. And we've also given to things that, um, that we didn't know that we would give to, like when the Central American earthquakes hit a year and a half ago. Um, um, we, we had the wherewithal to reach out to our immigrant um, from Mexico labor and say, um, how does this affect your families? And they told us, and, you know, we were able to donate to many families, and that was powerful. So, mm -hmm. so the, the experience of donating those roofs um, became powerful. And, and I meant to tell you, we've donated a million, over a million dollars of roofing in the last 11 years, along with the, all of the tiles being donated by Eagle, Eagle Roofing Products in, in Rialto. So we're, we're awesome. really excited about that. It's, it's become who we are. And, and, and it's how the, it's how the, the public knows us. They know us as people that are aligned with them and keep these, keeping families safe and dry and that believe that everyone deserves a decent place to live and, and that we believe that it's unimaginable to ignore sick children. By, and so what that does is we wear that, not with a proud pride, but with a, with a little bit of humble pride. You know, hey, mm -hmm. who can we help? And so it's been it's been an awesome journey. Looking back, I, I've never tried to weave it and tell the story until the last couple of years because I never saw it happening. You know, I, when we gave those roofs, we didn't talk about it. We couldn't talk about it because it felt wrong. You know, let, don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing, as I remember somebody telling me as a kid over and over again. And, you know, it's like um, it, it was hard to talk about. Habitat started talking about ants saying, hey, they're donating roofs and transforming lives. And I'm like, oh, my God, can you say that? Are we get struck by lightning and and then I for one year and i decided i need to talk about it because i need people to understand who we are we're doing this and and, and i i think it's important and when we started talking about it it really changed everything because what happened is it we refined that compassion muscle grew and mm -hmm. we found that the only way it could grow would be to talk about it some more. And so now it's so much a part of who we are. We're very involved in a lot of boards that give back, boards that oversee nonprofits. And of course, I'm on the board of Habitat for Humanity, Orange County, and Orange County Ronald McDonald House, um, in addition to several other local boards and several national boards, roofing industry. And this is, this is the most awesome thing. And it all kind of started from just not saying no. It's kind of that ask that you don't think you can do and you somehow do it like your, you know, dad, my dad's voice, my mom and dad, their voices ring in my ear like, do the right thing, son. You know, it's like my dad always <laughs> did the right thing. I mean, yeah. annoyingly, my dad did the right thing. I mean, it was like, God, why are we doing this? And I did the right thing most of the time, but out of this fear of God thing, and now I don't <laughs> have that anymore. I can do it because it's awesome because yeah. I'm happier, because I get a better version of me. And it kind of all started from this silly thing where I just couldn't let anybody have a leaky roof because I didn't have the money to pay. So yeah. That's a long spiel, man. I'm going I'm to let no, you steer I, me I think that, here. I think that sets the, the foundation uh, for, for really what, what we're hoping to talk about. And, uh, but it is, it is an amazing story. And it, it really, I think, you know, once this is all over, we'll do the podcast eventually in person the way that we wanted to, which was, you know, how do you be a profitable business and yet give back to the community? And I think you could speak a lot on that. And I think we could have a great conversation around and it, just encouraging other business founders, owners, CEOs to be more philanthropic in what they do. And, and I think that'd be a great conversation for us to have. Um, but today yes. we're day two. Uh, so it's April 2nd, right after a few laws were passed April 1st around COVID-19 right in the middle of that crisis. 
you know, you guys are still up and running, but you were just showing me prior to this, kind of giving me a tour of uh, some of the offices. It doesn't look the same, right? Because hardly anyone's in the office, um, but you guys are still operating uh, probably almost, if not completely at full capacity, just a little more remote than normal. Um, but really what I was hoping to, to, to get out of you is your experience around leading and how to lead an organization in what I would call a crisis like this. Um, you know, is there something that comes to mind that, that you guys are doing that you really feel is, is a powerful way to lead your organization in a time like this? Well, there's a lot of things and I don't have experience talking about this. So we might swim a little bit. Uh, um, however, uh, uh, two weeks ago, um, Roofing Technology Think Tank, a national uh, um, play that we're original founding members of, because it's the only roofing technology and innovation platform that really exists. And I was watching this, and they came up two weeks ago with like the first uh, national podcast that was well known by an entity, na entity nationally, and they were they were really uh, championing staying focused and doing best practices in this crisis. And as it emerged, I tuned in and Steve Little, who owns a roofing company, K-Post and, and Ken Kelly from Kelly Roofing in Florida. Uh, they're two good friends of mine, uh, fellow servants of the roofing industry and board members. They, um, they spoke. And, and I think that sometimes I can say it better from somebody else. And I remember mm -hmm. both of them said this, but I remember in particular, um, um, Steve and Steve said, you know, our job right now is to lead. Our job yeah. is to be steady in the moment. Our job, we've been through this. We've been through things. We haven't been through this. He didn't say that. Um, yeah. We've been through things. We have more experience. Um, and so to that end, I would say the same thing. It is really critical for those of us in any business, at, especially at the senior management level, but I would take that down to your managers, and I think it's hitting people this way, but it's really critical that we are, we are steady in the moment because the news hits us every which way, and it swings or it, what looks like good news mm -hmm. or bad news, and our job is to steady both. And so I, my rule with one of my executive teams and we meet daily right now, is that our rule, it's not my rule, it's our rule, um, is that no messaging goes out, no messaging, external, internally, without that review. And so there's times when we hear one of these news stories, oh my God, we're going to shut down or whatever. And okay, calm down. And I'm able to in the moment say, hey, there's everybody's digesting this. There's no urgency. Let's meet mm -hmm. in two hours. And I'm going to the CEO of this national company, and I'm going to call this Congress. We're going to we're going to figure it out, and this is how we figure it out. And it's been really beautiful. It's been beautiful, and this is not the wrong, right word. I'm not. Can you? I'd love it if you could edit that, but if I get it, no, it's, <laughs> it's not. It's the wrong word for the moment. In this difficult times, there are some good stories. There's some good people. We people emerging right now. There are apps emerging. Like what? Oh. We know the apps and the people that are really making things happen. That's just a fascinating thing to me. Um, but in our job, my job, number one, is to steady the flow of information and to be mm -hmm. that ballast. And I think that I remember yeah. that. And then in, in our executive team, we're fortunate enough to be large enough to have executive team. We really got it evenly divided between finances, digging, digging daily. And we're applying for loans. We're, we're trying to understand every offering. This two and a half months employment, reimbursement strategy. We are making sure we're raising hand for everything. So I don't know details. Audrey handled that. Audrey Schneider does a great job. Mm -hmm. HR is very busy. All of their time in HR. Um, yeah. and, and pause. Susan's so busy with something entirely new that's evolving constantly. And yeah. her, her knowledge and her focus is her experience and her messaging is, is powerful. Her and Aaron last night, I've been doing internal messages almost every day. And they're from safety, from, uh, you know, internal safety with this exposure, with all of this messaging that we're all doing. But, but I had, they gave a message last night, Aaron, my VP of sales, and her that was highly specific on new things that we need to do. And, and they're, thank, 
I'm so grateful that I have them. And then the other VP is yeah. Aaron, it's my VP of sales. And man, he's being very, and there's a lot he has to do with health and messaging internally because he oversees production in the field, but he's also being very innovative in, in sales. We've talked about the power of video for some time, but we've never really used it. Man, yeah. I've got videos to record today to people that I love in the industry that need to hear where we're at. And Aaron, I've watched him you know, record hundreds of videos and I'm watching my sales team. We're innovating in the moment. And so there are opportunities that I need to remind people that we need to, we need to encourage and we need to be positive about. We need to say, isn't this exciting that this is working? And, and there's also a big grace. And in my company, we're fortunate that we're able to be strong in the moment because we are prepared for a drought year. We have lots of ways to save money with tax planning that we could leak into a bad year. So we're prepared for that. And that's important. Yeah. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that before. No, that was uh, that you actually went exactly where I kind of wanted you to go because uh, you know I followed you just on LinkedIn and I've seen a lot of your messaging going out that you've put out there to the public and I think that really ties into to to a key point which is you know it I think it's very important for every business leader for every founder every CEO out there um, more than ever to keep that constant communication both to the public as well as to your own internal team your employees, those that work for you, and just have that consistent communication going out to them, you know, whether it's, you know, filtered or not, as you said, whether you, whether it's yes. filtered through a team, I think that is probably the most key thing out there is whether you've laid off or furloughed your employees or your employees are still working and they're out in the field, and they're working remote, yeah. there has yeah. to be constant communication to them. Those best communicators that I collaborate with are reminding me and I'm reminding everybody that I can that, and it's hard to do this because it feels counterintuitive at times, but it's a time to over communicate and not, you don't have to be accurate. Just tell them where you're at. So you'll, yeah, you see me do showing somebody, I've done a couple videos showing the empty office. I think that gives a sense of reality to everybody. And it's important externally that we understand that. And also it shows that we're not here. A 20,000 square foot building, there's four people here that have to be here. And also there was another moment um, through this panic and whether you're a business, you know, like, you know, are we an essential service? And, and internally we didn't all agree and we had to break it down. What is essential? Oh my gosh, there's rain coming. And we have all these people when every rain, we have rain coming again next week. And we have people that need their homes protected. And so we are being really responsible in the moment. And we have difference of opinions, which bet together into safe protocol. And so, yeah. I mean, my C on a disc scale is low and I don't want to explain what that means. So those don't understand, but <laughs> I think in HR, everyone knows what that means. And so um, you know, my, I wouldn't, have had, I wouldn't have had everybody out of here three weeks ago. I would have, I would have probably gone with the flow, which would have been a week, a week and a half, two weeks ago. But no, my senior HR team argued really hard, two of them, and probably all three. But like, no, you know, hey, we need to get people out of here now. And I couldn't conceive of what was happening yet. But that's the collaboration you need. Collaborate, collaborate. So in the overcommunication, you also ask for overcommunication back. So in every video that I send internally, I say, tell us, are you scared? Tell us, you know, I get it. And, and I yeah. think that they are, you know, I, I think that they are, people are communicating and, you know, everybody's scared. Everything's changing. There's all, and it takes our brains a while to contextualize this. You know, we're not driven by our, our cognitive brain. It's our reptilian brain. Our reptilian brain is driven by habit. We can't contextualize even economists that's trying to understand where we're going. They can't contextualize it yet because they haven't lived anywhere near it. And so there's, there's a lot of adjusting going on. There's a lot of uh, sociology happening right now. There's fascinating stories. And, and this is a time you just have to be adaptive and curious. I mean, mm -hmm. Darwin was right. It's not the strongest or the fastest to survive. It's the most adaptive to change. And so, you know, play to the visionaries, the vision, play to the creativity, make failure a positive thing. Fail fast. Hey, fail, but fail fast and let's laugh about it. Let's learn from yeah. it. This is, this is the time we have to have that adaptive brain mentality and, mm -hmm. and we're going to be okay. And, and I'm fortunate enough that we are piled in a way to protect our people. We even put a half a million into our donor advised fund to pump that up so we can continue our giving. And our giving uh, you know, felt at first like, oh, we got to hang on. But no, I'm like, oh no. And this is, this is a this is that same moment. Like, how can I possibly 
um, fix, donate this roof for this little girl. It's happening right now. I'm, I'm living it. I go to bed. I wake up early. What are we going to do? And you know what I'm coming to? And I don't know what we're going to do, but this is going to be a big year of giving. And you know why? Because we can. And it just comes down to that. Because we're going to walk into a bigger need gap than I've ever mm-hmm. experienced in my life, lifetime, yeah. very likely. I mean, I have to prepare for that, even though I'm an optimist. And, and I'm very fortunate that we have all, almost a million dollars, I don't remember what it is, in our donor advice fund. And, and we are going to be able to make a significant contribution this year. Yeah. I'm paused right now, Matt, because I don't understand the needs. It's a new world. So it took me about a week of you know, deer in the yeah. headlight. And, and then I realized, oh, my God, shelter? Yeah, we're keeping these. We donated roofs, roofing to keep the wooden floor and other local nonprofits dry in the moment in the rains. But no, the biggest need happening right now all around the country is food, food insecure people, elderly people that are locked in their homes. They're sheltered and they are so lonely and they are so hungry. And so we got involved in food delivery because that was what we heard. I couldn't get there myself. I'm not a food economist, but I have friends that are. They explained it to me. Now we're getting involved there. But our involvement mm-hmm. right now has been mostly um, flat. We're donating, um, like I said, we're donating the space next door, which is ours, 6,000 feet to American Red Cross on Monday and another time, at least one other time. And, you know, we're doing everything we can to help. But our, we have not given up major value yet. But we will when we understand how we can help. And I don't know if it's going to be more roofing donated here. I don't know if it's going to be money donated here. But, but it's, it's mm-hmm. something that is part of our DNA. And I know that's the reason we're around. Why that? I can just tell you story after story of being busted, having no way to do it, but not giving up that commitment. Just like Habitat, five, six years ago, we're going through a time and, and we couldn't, and, you know, I couldn't get another to do the roof and we just kept donating. I didn't know how we were going to do it. I've got story after story after story that when the tough, when it gets tough, you say yes. Yeah. You, it, I, I've never he- heard of anybody that was a credible story that lost in any way from giving too much. I just, mm-hmm. I don't know that story. I mean, uh, you know, you, you could, you could hear somebody um, make up a story that wouldn't be credible, but it's not a credible story. It's just the way you thrive. Whatever you give away comes back. And I said that I, I've heard that. I never really believed it, but you know, <laughs> in the essence, not what exactly, but the essence of how you gave it, the essence comes back a hundred times. And, you know, yeah. I, I'm not driven for monetary things except for helping others. So I don't see myself as a rich person, but extremely rich in, in relationships and in compassion and mm-hmm. in joy. And that's a weird word that I would never use three years ago, but I mean, I'm a joyful person. I'm a way more joyful person than I've ever been. And even in the moment, I can find happiness and, and a balance because I, because uh, of the giving, I think, you know, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not um, saying that, Oh, look at me. What I give. I'm, not. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, Oh my God, like, dude, try this. This is like, I don't know why this works. I don't know why I'm happy. You know, I don't know why my people in tough times are happier than probably other people. But, but it's because we're curious and it's because we believe in happy endings for people. And we believe that every person must be acknowledged and be seen as high, higher than they can see themselves so that they can grow into that and then be a flashlight for other people. I mean, this is a, so there's a big opportunity time right now. And so I try to be, as a leader, somebody that can offer that hope. And I do it internally the best I can. And I don't think I'm the best there. I don't. I'm good in some parts of it. And I do it externally um, for mm-hmm. several nonprofits and for our industry. And, and that's, you know, and I love doing that. I love being yeah. a, a beacon of hope um, for roofers who see themselves lowly that hide their hands in their pocket, which some roofers do. I used to, I didn't want you to see the caulking of my nails and that bloody thumbnail. And now, you know, look at me. I mean, I've, you, ha- you see my hands in this. If you were to have a tracker, I have 70% hands to 30% head. I mean, I am, <laughs> I use my hands all the time when I talk. I am proud of these hands. These are the hands that protect families, 
and everything we love in this company and keeps them safe and dry. And that's what I tell roofers, you know, that's who we are. Yeah. And the roofing industry, by the way, is the most generous industry. I, I, I don't know a roofer that doesn't, that has a different philosophy. I don't yeah. know a roofer who, that, I mean, roofers donate roofs all the time. They just didn't talk about it. And, you know, but, but my, my, my news, if, if any roofing professionals are listening to this or anybody that's giving, I'm going to tell you, baby boomer, that broken brain where you think you're not supposed to talk about it, you're going to talk about it. Because if you don't talk about it, it's going to grow. I used to not talk about it, and I hit it almost in some weird thing. I don't know it was. I don't know why I don't want to get into that. But now I talk about it, and I learn to talk about it by mimicking companies that do the same thing. And because of it, we're creating a network that's giving hope and showing a path all the way to everybody. Now, in this economy, what we're in right now, I don't know what that's going to be like. I know that I, I know that we can be that we can do better than most. But I, I'll mm -hmm. go further. I don't know that we can't thrive. I have to say that, even though what we're looking. I also see very something we much much ten years ago. But I but I I choose to see it this side because it gives me power. And it yeah. gives me power to get better roofs. It gives me power to lift people up and lift people internally. All my stakeholders, you know, all seven groups, employees, to customers, to my supply chain, to the nonprofit partners, everyone. That's that's our job. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's the best way uh, for us to end the conversation, really, is just that uh, now is the time more than ever to give to your local community, to give in any way that you can. Um, if you find yourself with plenty, then there's plenty of people out there that are in dire need. Um, and then I think you also hit really well on that key point of, of just making sure that you're communicating. And that would be, you know, externally outside the company as well as internally as well. All right. I, I, well, I well, probably should do that more than what I, and I tell myself in, every day probably got two externally please still have other ways and then internally but yeah I, I think you should almost challenge her to do it every day yeah. I, it's fast things are turning I, I mean everybody's slipping on a banana pill every time they pull down their newsfeed it's like oh, how does that affect me you know I mean yeah. you're scared am I gonna get sick you're scared am I gonna lose my job so communication I need to do it absolutely. more absolutely yeah um, so if, if someone wanted to reach out to you or to Antis, they need a roof repaired. Most of my listeners are in Orange County. You know, what uh, What should they do to reach out to you? What's the best you way to reach email out to me. you? You can email me at charles at antisroofing.com. And I would love, I would love to chance to keep you safe and dry. But even, I got to admit, I'm more excited if you link up with me on LinkedIn, where we yeah. become, uh, we can help move the dial more in this way because um, we're looked at across the country in Orange County and in my space. I mean, we Orange County shines well. So let's get involved. And, and I know that a lot of your listeners are down here, but I know you have listeners everywhere. But let's let, connect with, and I would love to, and I'd love to emulate, I would love to share with you the people that talk about the social give, give good thing. It's hard to talk about, but we're connected. So we borrow ideas and we sort of emulate each each other and people in this space we like to be copied we don't we don't say you copied me we go dude hey high five you know it's like <laughs> it's a cool deal I, I have i didn't know business could be so effing friendly just so you know like let's fight and now i'm like let's hug well yeah let's do an air, air hug, air hug. <laughs> from six feet away right <laughs> yeah. yeah excellent well thanks for coming on the podcast charles i appreciate your hey. time and I'm excited to see what you guys are going to do and, and what Ansys Roofing is going to look like after this. Cool. All right, man. Thank you. Looking Thank forward you. to seeing this. Yeah.